teleshikues të ndërruar ju nxat jetha. Në intervistën e sonët me speciale, kemi një mësafir të veçant, një mik të Kosovës, që vjen nga popullin mik dhe ushtëria aliate amerikane, komandantin e kampit Bonstil, kolonelin Michael Spragins. Come on, welcome to our studio. Thank you for having me. Uh, since this might be one of your first TV interviews uh, for the media outlets of Kosovo, could you please give to our audience a little introduction about your civilian and military background for them to better know who's running the American military mission to Kosovo? Sure. So, as you introduced me, Colonel Mike, most of my friends call me Mike uh, Spragans. Uh, I am the commander of Multinational Battle Group East which is made up of active duty units and National Guard units. And I'm proud to say that my brigade headquarters that I represent uh, is from the 39th Infantry Brigade out of Arkansas. And uh, we also have the Mississippi National Guard with us as well. So as we talk about the National Guard, uh, there are a lot of soldiers that are part-time soldiers. And the way that works is we have a civilian career that we, we work at most of the week. And then on the weekends, we train for our National Guard or our military jobs. And my career is actually in education. I have been a music educator and I have been a school administrator. A lot of people don't quite understand those, how those work together, mm -hmm. but I will say that the leadership piece of that actually works very closely. Mm -hmm. And one, it's neat for me to share stories with kids of my military stuff. I'm an artillery officer, and as an artillery officer, we get to do exciting things like blow things up, and kids always love those stories. But with my teachers, uh, I get to share lots of stories about leadership and how soldiers learn is not unlike how students learn in a school. It's, it's about processes, it's about uh, establishing uh, good communications and rapport. And uh, I think there's just a lot of parallels between my military and civilian career. Uh, there has been almost a month since you took over the commanding responsibility of the multinational battle group east of K4 from your predecessor, Colonel Lusk. Can you give us your first impressions of Kosovo and the people you've met? Can you disclose some of your activities during this period? Well, the first word I want to use is fascinating. I have thoroughly enjoyed traveling around Kosovo, uh, both by helicopter and in ground. Uh, it's a beautiful country with fascinating, beautiful, interesting people. Um, I've learned a, a little. I feel like there's a lot more to learn about the culture here. Uh, I've enjoyed eating in the local restaurants quite a bit. I've actually done some shopping. Um, the fruit uh, is amazing here, so I will tell you that I'm enjoying all the produce that you have to offer. As far as the mission goes, um, our mission is pretty simple. Our, we're here for provide safe and secure environment and freedom of movement so that we can enable the success of the political process in Kosovo. And really, when it comes down to it, that's, it's a pretty simple mission. It's complicated in how we do it sometimes, but in, in simple terms, we're here as needed to improve the, the security situation, or actually I would say more so than anything, uh, maybe sustain a already great security situation. And peace. And peace, absolutely. Balkans is becoming a hot topic in international relations, particularly in the security point of view. Last year, an organized terrorist group attempted to organize a coup against the government of Montenegro. Another attempt was deterred by the regional joint forces before the soccer match between Albania and Israel. Last night, a group of Serbian and Russian citizens were intercepted by the police while crossing illegally to Kosovo. We don't know their intentions. What is your assessment of the sec current security situation in Kosovo, or say it wider, maybe security in the region? Well, I'm not an expert in the region, so there's not a lot of things that I could really uh, add to your, your comments there. But I think the good news story is you articulated that the Kosovo police intercepted these people who were crossing the border illegally. That tells me you have a system that is working. Uh, in our country, in the United States, I'm familiar with the southwest border and there are interceptions of people crossing. In any country, that's an issue. It sounds to me that the good news story here is you have a police force that is doing their job, and it sounds like they did it very effectively. I believe each commander of a deployment sets uh, his goal and object objectives at the beginning of a new responsibility. Can you disclose some of them within your responsibilities? What challenges do you see coming what are the opportunities that you may have identified as unexplored here? Uh, I think the unexplored challenges 
maybe not any different than the mission before me. We're going to continue to work alongside the Kosovo security forces and the Kosovo police, Kosovo border police, to um, assist when necessary, but also just um, augment their operations to make sure, as you mentioned earlier, about the enforcement of, of the border um, and continue and to uh, do the programs that we've done before. We work a little bit with the TRADOC um, in providing assistance there through the embassy teams that have the lead in that mission. But our, our soldiers will stay engaged in the same kind of missions that we've done before. Uh, a few years ago, uh, when Camp Bonsfield North Town was getting disassembled, there were growing security and, and economic concerns among the population of Kosovo, and particularly Ferizai, about their future. Uh, people saw it uh, then as a signal of American withdrawal, possibly from this part of the Balkans. What is the future of Camp Bound Steel? Well, I think it's, um, it's a very concerning thing whenever people consider the, the economic implications and bases in the United States when they talk about drawing down or, or changing, that becomes a concern. So what I'd like to say about Bond Steel is there's been some adjustments made in the past way before me coming here, of course. But what I can tell you right now is that I can't tell you what the future holds. That's up to policymakers to decide what happens in, in years to come. But right now, I know my mission here with the current amount of soldiers and support that's at Bond Steel is consistent for the next nine months. I know that our replacements have been named. Uh, they look forward to coming in and flowing in behind us. So I expect to see some consistency there. Um, policymakers will make those decisions as necessary, and a lot of those just depend on the future. So we may say another 17 months, or we have Americans here at least. I, I, th I think that's probably a safe assessment, <laughs> but I don't want to speak for those who make those decisions. Uh, do you see any threats for Kosovo? What would be your response to eventual instability triggered by inner or outer circles? Well, uh, not to get in the operational piece because I'm not here to talk about those types of things. I'm, I am pleased that so far the political process has been uh, one that's fairly peaceful. I know there is a lot of concern on what the future holds, but I think um, it's very uh, admirable that so far there's been arguments that have been words um, and not violence. And I would just hope that the people of Kosovo continue to work through the process in a nonviolent way and that uh, um, they can work through these differences in the near future. Uh, can U.S. Army or Department of Defense advocate somehow in the U.S. for increase of uh, private investments here? I mean, since the end of the war, Kosovo has received a valuable support from the U.S. government and the military, whether it was financial or technical assistance or training in different fields. But there are very few private corporates investors from the U.S. to Kosovo, if we compare them, their number with Serbia, with their presence in Croatia and elsewhere in the region. We don't even have McDonald's or Burger, Burger King. Yes, but you here. have Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> yes, we do. So um, what can Army do or DOD about uh, you know, promoting Kosovo as a, an investor opportunity in the States, or right. do they do it? Well, you've got a great question, but it's not for the U.S. Army. Um, mm -hmm. I know because I sit uh, on the ambassador's uh, briefing with all of his mm -hmm. ambassador's team, and I know there is a lot of things working, and there are, there are specialty areas that are working in economic development. That's definitely not my lane of expertise, but uh, I'm encouraged to hear of a lot of economic development things and projects that are going on. Again, not my area of expertise, but... I will say, driving up and down the road, there is there's quite a bit of um, entrepreneurship going on. Mm -hmm. I see um, uh, really nice furniture stores. Uh, I see a lot of nice cars. I see a lot of construction and construction materials. All of those, to me, look like great economic indicators. Um, the answer is, um, maybe it's a Kosovo answer, but I, I think that there are people working with the government of Kosovo through our ambassador's office that are really looking at that. Intelligence plus character, that's the, that is the true goal of education. It's a universal quote by Martin Luther King Jr. for a would-be perfect educational system of a country. Colonel Spragans, you hold a master's degree in science of education. During this short time since you got here, 
coincided with summer vacations and pausing of the local school system. Have you been able to meet our system, educational leaders, principals of the schools? Uh, have you been able to gather information about our system, youth potential? Give us some advice of a roadmap to a safer and better society, uh, well, as you may envision, maybe. I won't be so bold as to give advice on how to run an education system. Um, I, I have my own thoughts and I have some experience. Um, and you I'm may very, have tips and tricks. Too. I may have some tips and tricks. But I'm encouraged because I did meet with a team that has been working with the education ministry here. And I learned a lot actually just this morning about the education system. And some of the encouraging things that I heard were some similarities to what I would call the cutting edge um, mindsets in, in education in the United States. Um, I heard things where the education system is examining what it is that industry needs. Uh, what are they looking at in future employees? And so one of those things that we've discussed in the United States and I heard resonate this morning were problem solving skills, uh -huh. the ability to collaborate with others. Some of those things that it's not just a skill that I know how to do math or I know how to do a certain trade, it's being able to apply it and work with others to solve problems. More like practical education or focused. I, I heard that and I heard that um, there's different schools so that you have some tracks that are looking at vocational education, you have some that are looking at more of a college preparatory. So I'm very encouraged to hear that those trends are, are resonating. Um, I also know that you have a system that's very similar in is that you have school boards and you have in the local communities. The United States is, is education system is very similar in that um, they believe very strongly in local control. Now, that's, that can be frustrating for some people but we all know that you know, if you live in a community, you want some voice in how the school is run. And I think it's important that uh, people recognize that and they know who those elected officials are who represent that. And just as I've told uh, parents in my own school district that, that if they don't like policies, then they need to discuss that with their school board members because I really take the policies that are given to me as a principal and I apply those because my school board who signs my paycheck told me these are our policies. I understand that that's just a process and so um, I kind of digress a little bit. I think there's some encouraging trends mm -hmm. and I'm actually looking forward to uh, meeting with some future educational leaders uh, and sharing with them. And my points are going to be here's the things that uh, I would suggest not to do as a principal <laughs> and some of the things that actually work for me. Uh, but I think I heard this as well. In, in 20, 30 years ago when you and I were in school, principals were the guys that carried keys to all the doors and the paddle, right? So when kids get in trouble. And what I'm hearing now is, is the same thing in the United States. We expect the principals of schools to be educational leaders. They understand what teachers are supposed to be doing. They understand their curriculum. They interact with the teachers and the students in a professional way. And I hope uh, and I see and hear that that's some of the trends that are going on in the coastal education system. So I'm looking forward, maybe we can come back and talk about some of those things in the future. Yeah, um, th there is also a concern about the management uh, in educational system. Mm -hmm. um, can you give us some tips on, on how to improve the, you know, uh, elected or appointed managers of the schools. How does it work in the States actually? Yeah. How is that uh, voice of the parent conducted right. into a practical solution of finding the best principal for the school? Sure. So a process in America is that first there is a minimum qualification. So just like a teacher has to have a certification, a school principal has a certification. And in the, in the United States we have superintendents of school districts and they have to have certification for their level of, of leadership. The superintendent and the school board work together to create policy and they are the ones who hire and fire teachers. And so is it, with that hierarchy, I think there are some similarities to, to this. And to answer your question about how do people get involved, I go back to in your community, understanding who those leaders are and engaging them at the local level. I think, you know, the, the voice of a, a democratic uh, representative government is people articulating their voice. Um, and I don't think Kosovo people are, are intimidated by sharing their voice. I think that's a positive uh, aspect that I've seen here, that they're very vocal. And that's what I would say, if you want to improve schools in your community, be very vocal. Um, mm -hmm. We have a saying, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. 
Yeah. You know, you, 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 they, they get tired of you griping a little bit. If you want to change the schools, then get involved. Yeah. Um, what are the key four intentions for the cooperation with the local schools? I mean, do you see any space for enhancements of contacts, joint programs, maybe exchange of experience with, your, with our future scientists, artists, and sportsmen and women? Well, I think the United States offers a lot of that. Some of our National Guard soldiers that um, are part of my formation have some unique skill sets. That's not necessarily our mission here. But uh, we are looking at doing some. You can community. add on to. to we, well, within <laughs> within a certain degree, I do want us to be involved in some community what we call civic uh, support projects, and and we're looking at trying to reach out to some of the local schools and do some things where our soldiers help clean up playgrounds and and interact. That's part of our culture. It's our uh, citizen soldiers. We we are involved in our communities, active duty, national guard. It's the same. We, we are involved in communities, and we want to do that because we think it's important that uh, they see this uniform, they see our patches, but they have to know that behind this uniform is a person who has a family, uh, has the same aspirations as them. And we, we are here to represent what we feel like, um, what we would want in our own country as far as uh, protecting people, protecting life, protecting rule of law. Just 30 years ago, in this place, the concept of a civil society organization was seen as strange, foreign, or even dangerous. Now there are hundreds, if not thousands, uh, civil society organizations operating in Kosovo, making their contributions in different fields from democracy building to humanitarian assistance. What is your position on working with the civil society of Kosovo? How important it is to cultivate the spirit of civic action in a democratic society? Well. Uh in the military role, we're not involved in that. That's, that's not my mission. Um, but as, as myself, I, I think civic organizations are, are like the heart of a community. And I think you can also uh, measure a community's spirit a lot of times by those people who are willing to get out and do civic projects. I'm not as familiar as how those work here in Kosovo, but I think they're great organizations. In the United States, Lions Clubs, Rotary Clubs, um, those types of organizations bring in business leaders, members of the community that, that do fundraisers to help in the communities and um, Rotarians and other. And I, I believe there's some in here. Yeah, um, there's I'm Rotary a Lion Club. Yeah. Back oh, home, I'm in, in the Lions Club and we promote vision. And, uh, and we probably have some, some clubs here and I would love to see even yeah. some of our soldiers maybe participate in some of those civic clubs. Okay, yeah, the, we are wrapping up this short interview. Um, yeah. What would be your message to our viewers who are predominantly of a younger generation? Sure. As a commander of uh, MNBG East. Well, uh, the first thing that I would, see, would like to say is that um, I, I would hope that they look at the political process and continue to think of things that soon they will be in a position to make decisions. So. That being said, they need to be educated. And I'm going to go back to my civilian career. I can't stress the amount of importance for students to get at least a minimal education. And being a boy myself and raising a boy back home, I know that boys tend to want to do things with their hands. They want to play sports. They want to hunt and fish and do things like that. And reading and writing is not as exciting to them. But to get through that minimal education, because if they can read, and they can write a document, they can do math, then there's so many more opportunities for them. And when they get old and they can't do all the things with their hands that they, they used to, they're going to want to have that education to fall back on. And I know that there will be more opportunities if they have that education, and they will be better educated and better able and to be future leaders of this country. You've got a great country uh, that has a lot of neat um, uh, things going on and you've got some wonderful people that are working towards um, the future of Kosovo and I just want to encourage our young people to be very excited about the future and to be ready to take the torch and pass on uh, and take the future. Uh, Colonel, thank you for your time and your contribution for this show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I was the first time I was with Colonel Michael Spragins, Commandant kommandanten är fortsatt av amerikanen Kosov. Du följer med det ett par